Hello. For those who don't know me, my name is Brian Bell. My interest in railways began at the beginning of the first world of the second world. Sorry, I got that wrong. At the beginning of the Second World War, I went to an infant school, Macaulay Junior School, in Grimsby, and the school play the school playground. Uh, went right up to the railway fence alongside the railway from Grimsby to Greatcoats. And of course, like most children, we were interested in trains. Right, m my interest in railways began, began when I was at school and uh, with several other children we used to start taking engine numbers and uh, I remembered several numbers what used to go by regular and if it was regular numbers we used to boo and I always remember one of them was number 5511 which was the class D10 or D11 called Man. When my father came out of the army he was working on the railways as a fitter's mate and he worked at Immingham and one of my big treats at the time was that he used to get paid on a Friday and the only place they could get paid his salary was to go to Immingham. If I was off school on holiday or something like that, he would then take me on the tram and uh, we would go round the uh, engine shed at Immingham. I also had an uncle called Percy Osborne who was a driver in number three link which was called a fish link driving fish trains and if he was on duty on that day on that particular afternoon he used to say well I'm we're going to Grimsby at around about four o'clock in the afternoon to uh, pick up a fish train and if you like you can come and ride on the footplate with us of course I thought that was wonderful and after that my number one thing was, like most young men, I wanted to be an engine driver. When I left school at 15, I wanted to join the railway and go on to the footplate. But at that time, you were not allowed to go on the footplate until you were 16. So what I did, I uh, found a job in the carriage or wagon department at Grimsby oiling and greasing railway wagons. This was a difficult job and it really taught me safety, especially in the marshalling yards, because wagons were so quiet when they were rolling up and down the sidings. When I was 16, I then joined the footplate and that was at Immingham. So now, now I have moved on now until I was 16 year old and here I am at Immingham Loco and I started off as an engine cleaner. As an engine cleaner we had a charge on foreman called Jim Cox and uh, he had only got one leg and he could be quite a bit of a brute of a man and if you didn't clean the engines properly he would uh, get you to clean an old dirty austerity. So uh, that was a, quite a dirty job. There was a, uh, six of you in a team would clean an engine. Two on the boiler, two on the wheels and two on the tender. And it used to take you around about an hour to an hour and a half to clean an engine. Uh, one of the most dangerous bits was climbing on top of the boiler. Now on the B1s weren't too bad because the boiler diameter was much less than a K3. Now a K3 had got quite a, a wide circumference and uh, to climb on the top of that it, it really was, you, 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 there was nothing to get hold of but anyway you did Health and safety didn't exist in those days. <coughs> uh, 
Cleaning the wheels was very difficult because you had to clean all the spokes and I tell you the spokes were very dirty plus cleaning all the side rods and you had to cl really clean them hard and polish them. Now with the side rods you clean them with paraffin but with the rest of the body it was with oil. Before you started work every man was issued with a white rag and you looked after your white rag uh, really did look after it because you only got one and um, so you you could use your white rag especially when even when you were firing you had a white rag but you only got one and you really looked after it when the day was finished you hand the white rag in and then it went to be washed so it was called, called a washed right white a washed white rag and so it was these with what you clean the engine with <coughs> when we'd finished cleaning the engine we all gathered on the footplate and there we would sit in the fire, fireman's seat in the driver's seat pointing out what does this do what does that do be winding the wire, wheels round <laughs> and asking each one another questions what does this do what does that do and this is all part of learning about how to drive a railway engine. The thing we always used to do was pick up the firing shovel and put some coal on the fire, learning how to use the fireman's shovel and seeing if we could throw the coal onto the fire. Now that was difficult because you've got to get it through a very small hole, half a hole, and when you were firing properly, you used to bounce, bounce, sorry, you used to bounce the shovel on top of the round part of the fire grate, and that would then throw the coal into the fire. Now, sometimes you had to throw the coal at least six foot, so of course it took some doing, and then you had to guide it each side, each side, and also in the back corners. So this was all preparatory work for being a fireman. <clears throat> we only cleaned uh, express passenger engines and fish engines. Now fish engines at Immingham were the thing. And because there were six trains a day and Immingham, fish engines were something special. Normal passenger engines if there was depending how many cleaners there was because there was over over a hundred cleaners at Immingham at one time and um, it all worked on a seniority basis the top senior seniority cleaners once they'd passed out as past cleaners they could go out firing if there was a job available <coughs> the rest of the top past cleaners they then went labouring, cleaning the shed, sleep, sweeping the shed from end to end, every track, every track in there, 12 tracks. And uh, also you used to work in the manual coaling stage and that was where you used to go in, fill coal into some tubs on the, on the deck there and they were filled with prime Yorkshire coal. That coal was for solely for express engines and fish engines. And you used to coal about five engines a day in there. By doing it by hand, you could crack the coal all up into nice sized pieces for the firemen to use. And also you could stack it neatly on the tender so you could get maximum height of coal on the tender. Like most uh, firemen and drivers I retained a diary of all my firing turns. The rules was once you performed 287 firing turns you then passed out 
as a fireman. So this is one of the reasons why I did it. So here is when I went on the first fire in turn, 1952, with a driver called Charlie Maris. Most of the fire in turns were on pilot engines on the Mingham Dock, and that was with these coal, the coal engines, class 04s and austerities. And we also had one little um, saddle tankies. Called a saddle tanky because the tank, water tank, was like a saddle. Most of those worked at Grimsby. 18 different pilot engines worked at Grimsby, uh, all over the place. So, of course, you got sent to all these different places to do firing. Another place we went to was Barnaby, and they used to have three pilots at Barnaby with, um, now nah then, a J11. Oh, with these, these type engines, J11s. And um, what they used to do was they used to couple up onto a iron ore train, go into Frodingham, and because when it got near Frodingham, it was uphill up Santon Bank which was quite a climb. So you double-headed and assisted the, the train behind you. I used to enjoy going there because you got overtime. So uh, that was the thing about working on the railway. You live, you relied hell of a lot on overtime. That's what you needed, overtime, night rate, all that kind of thing. On the 10th of August 1953, I had my firing exam. What you had to do was go to see uh, an inspector. He would question you about what you know about railways, all about uh, signals, all that kind of thing. And then we went to Grimsby Town Station and got on a passenger train and the fireman got off it I got on and I fired it right away to Barnaby Station and that was it. The inspector told me then that I had achieved and I was passed out now as a fireman. It didn't make a lot of difference but I, I could now go on firing passenger trains and uh, by the 16th of September, I then had to do my national service examination. And then uh, within a year, I was called up to go in the army. After I'd finished my national service, I'd been credited with 199 firing turns. This uh, helped me with my pay. And um, I still went uh, called out to different firing turns, and uh, there was no none really of any uh, actual knowledge. But um, I, di I did. At, we did have to go to uh, Barnaby on Barnaby Pilot. Barnaby had, had three pilot engines at Barnaby with class J11s and uh, to get to Barnaby I had to get up at 3.15 in the morning and uh, go to Birmingham and catch uh, a goods train, first goods train which was going to Barnaby. The guard was sat on his seat which was fully padded around at each side and I was sat on a great big long square box with tools in and everything was all right until we got somewhere near um, ah, what do they call it? Where, where the mate? Melton Ross. Yeah, what do they call it? Um, Melton Ross. Yeah, Melton Ross. And uh, as we approached Melton Ross. 
all of a sudden I heard bang, 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 and I thought, oh, what's this? And the next thing, I was thrown from my seat, right from one end to the other. I looked in amazement at the guard, and I said, have we been derailed? He said, no, lad. He said, we've got a bad driver. And I remembered that. For all my time, I was on the footplate, and I thought, I am not going to do that to a guard. It was easy to do because it was all three link couplings. But if he was if he was careful, you could, you know, do it gentle. So I always remembered that. One of my one of the best trips we had was going to Cleethorpes, Cleethorpes Relief in the summer. And that's when all these summer specials used to come in. Most of them were coal miners working clubs. And uh, we could get 20, 30, 40 special trains would come in at the weekend. Over, my, over the 20 years I was on the footplate, I never really ever felt frightened. But, and I can assure you that when you're working on express trains in the dark, doing 90 miles an hour with no lights, it's a queer sensation. But you accept it. But the only time I ever felt frightened was really on a pilot. We had a turn at Imium called Cleethorpe's Pilot. And what it was, Cleethorpes had a pilot engine where it was shunting all the coaching stock in Cleethorpes station. And one of the firing turns we had to do was at around about tea time, we had to go up to uh, take up the parcels, Sheffield parcels train to Grimsby Town station. And then we used to get relieved by Sheffield men. We would wait there for the King's Cross train coming in from London. As soon as it came in, we would relieve the driver and fireman, take the engine off and run round to the opposite end. And then <laughs> we attach the engine to the train at the opposite end and set off for Cleethorpes. I thought this was marvellous working the Cleethorpes at Grimsby Express. But the honest problem was you were on tender first. Anyway, we got going all right. And it was non-stop at Grimsby Dock Station, non-stop. Tearing over Cleethorpes Road level crossing, looking at all the people, stopped there and went round all the, all the tight caves around Grimsby Fish Docks and then set off for Newclee and over the, um, the long strait. As we neared to Cleethorpe station, the, stick, the signal was on my side. And of course, as you were looking out, I was looking out through fingers like this, and all the coal dust kept blowing into my eyes. And as we got into the station platform, coming into the station platform, I noticed we were going into platform six. And I thought, we seem to be going very, very fast. So I looked at the driver and he seemed nonchalant. So anyway, we still were going quite fast. He'd shut off steam and we were still going fast, freewheeling, and we straight into platform six. Now that was right on the end, and it was all through all the caves, and now it was going down the platform. We were still going at fast speed, and there was a driver on one of the other platforms, and he was smoking a pipe, a big pipe, and he looked at us, and his jaw dropped, as if to say, what the hell is he doing? Anyway, as we were going down the straight into the platform, I could just see the buffer stops coming up. And I thought, what do I do? Do I jump off? Do I jump off? I thought, oh, no, no, I, I didn't, I didn't. And as we uh, 
only approach the, the buffers, the driver just put the, the brake down like that. <laughs> Which you never did. I mean, it's like stopping a car, putting your feet on the foot brake, hard on, bang. Put that. And of course, the train didn't stop instantly, but it stopped very, very suddenly. And uh, anyway, I looked at him, and he was stood up in the corner. And he said, "Now nah, then, kid." He was, he was a Yorkshireman. He said, "Now nah, then, kid." He says, "That'll prove we're not foreigners," which meant that you know we we weren't crews from away. And I was still tr trembling, trembling like hell. And he said, "Get round the back, take the lamps off." So I went round the back of the tender, and took one of the lamps off. Then he said, "Go on, get up to the single box, make a brew." So he got me Billy Can, and uh, I then walked across to the signal box. Now, usual signalmen always had a, a kettle on, on the boil to give you know the drivers and firemen a cup of tea. So I walked up the signal up, up the steps up the signal box, and uh, I walked in. He said, he looked at me, and went. Good God, lad, are you all right? I said, y y yes. He says, have you just come off London? I said, yes. He says, bloody hell. He said, I didn't think you were going to stop until you got to the boating lake. But anyway, it was later on I discovered that when he stopped, he smashed all the plates in the kitchen, in the, in the buffy car. That's how bad it was. So, uh, and that really frightened me that day. So now I was keen to become a proper fireman, and uh, I met my future wife, and I said, "If we get married, would you be prepared to move away?" So she said, "Yes." I'd saved up enough money to buy a house small house so she's right so I said well I've been looking to go to Peterborough so she says well let's go and have a look around Peterborough and see what we think so we went to Peterborough and uh, I eventually saw a house which I fancied and I could afford so um, Peterborough which was New England shed was on the main line and uh, a lot of mainline work. So I thought, yes, I'm going to transfer here. So that's what I did. I transferred and uh, that's where I finished up.